studied computer science. I, I, I took courses in AI and machine learning. I understand what machine learning is. I don't understand what AI is. Um, so, I don't know, maybe you want to take a stab at it and share it. I think the AI is the same. I mean, one of the things that I like that I'm looking for, by the way, is, is getting you know, a machine to do things that, that only people can do. So it's a forever shifting definition. But how did, so, 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 but. Should we say this? So what I understand is that machine learning is teaching a machine uh, how to perform certain tasks or activities uh, the way a human would do it, or not necessarily human, but teaching a machine how to do something. Right, uh, and you generally can't teach. Uh, you can only you, you can write an algorithm. You can write an algorithm that would do one thing. But if you wanted the machine to learn by itself, which is what machine learning implies, uh, you start feeding it data, and then it, based on the base algorithm, it tries to understand how to use that data to make better decisions. So, what is AI? Because I hear a bot. This is a broader yeah, it's a uh, yeah. only one uh, branch inside the whole area of AI. So what else? Is... You can say AI is automation, basically. To some extent, it's not wrong. It's just to automate things that people have been doing since the beginning, but now we're able to make it automated. So that's in a very broad sense what AI is. About. But there are many ways of doing it, right? So the thought is learning. It could be that... Uh, well, Wikipedia says that uh, <laughs> a machine mimics cognitive functions such as learning and problem solving. So I guess you could, you're right. It's a very broad area. It covers a lot of things. Um, as, uh, yeah. It could be like more like brute force. You know, it's like mm -hmm. AlphaGo or the Blue. It's not really just, just throw a lot of machines, right? I mean, it's more like brute force. It's not really like super intelligent, right? It's just like trying to use the fact that you can run many cycles of machines faster. That's another approach. I think we look at an example of what Microsoft did with the bot, the Twitter bot, and it went really badly online. I don't know if you guys read that. That they still considered artificial intelligence. Not well executed, but still, I mean, there was some learning. Uh, I guess you don't trust the internet to give you input to your <laughs> learning algorithms. But, you know, um, I've had some uh, experience writing a uh, Twitter bot as well, just as a hobby. Uh, the thing about Twitter is that they try to catch bots that pretend not to be bots, right? So there's a team on Twitter that uh, finds um, fake accounts and they, and they delete them, right? So one of the hobbies I have is to, I don't keep pets, but I keep Twitter bots. So I write <laughs> algorithms that try to trick, the, try, pick, trick people to think that it's an actual person tweeting. So, um, uh, yeah, so you can see there's artificial intelligence as well. Uh, mimicking intelligence. Yeah. That goes back to the Turing test. I mean, you yes. yeah. mm -hmm. tend to be human in a conversation. Yeah. Certain, certain technologies, certain platforms, it's easier to pretend to mimic a human on Twitter because it's just text. Yeah. Facebook's a bit more difficult because there's so many more mediums of sharing. There's more conversations going on on Facebook. So, so just going a level deeper. I think we It's like there's like all the shop, like there's no like governance of the term. And um, so it's difficult to put a box around it because firstly people will use it, a salesman might use it to sell something, and a researcher might agonize over like what's in it and what's not in it. And depending on which researcher you go to, they will cut the domain in different ways. Um, I was wondering whether just to put up as like a starting point, like three like concentric circles, uh, like um, and then right in the middle. And uh, for next percent you have AI, and another for next percent you have like a general AI. Then you kind of like talk about what's in one and not in the other, stuff like that. So the knowledge will not be Does anybody know how the actual Turing test competition works? 
No, no idea. No idea. <coughs> well, I don't think it's a competition. I know how the press no, yeah, works. It's, it's still it's going on. It's still every day, every year. There is a, uh, there is still a competition. You know the mechanics is uh, they get a, a test full of people oh. interact with the machine. Yeah. And then it guesses and it ends people as well. It guess which are people which are people. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the important thing is that you have uh, people who are testing, and on the other side there will be machines and there will be humans. But the interface is the same, right? You interrupt. Uh, yeah. But from year to year, they're like, how long do you spend? Uh, what type of questions you can ask? This can change. The, the funny thing about this competition is there are actually two awards. The one team wins the one, the computer system which wins the, which fools the most humans, right? That's the, that's the, be the best part. And the, the human who gets voted least as a machine, because that's another possibility, right? You are interacting with a human, but you may be marked as a, as a you may have to make a decision. Yeah. Are you talking to a computer or are you talking to a human? So <coughs> humans get marked as machines. <laughs> Do they get right? So there are there are there are two there are two uh, words. That's the, the most ah. human computer and the most human human. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So when you when you're talking about bots, right? And Twitter bots. So how do you all right, this is getting a little more like in, in the next level of it. How do you train the bot to act like the human? What are you doing? Right. So, um, what I did initially was uh, I searched for, for, for tweets online and I, I threw them to the database and I changed around the words to, to make the tweet look legitimate and not a copy. But later on, I found certain uh, language processors online where you can uh, create a uh, what do you call it? Create an insult, for example. So I changed the way the engine works and I created sentences from there. So it's just English structure based on certain trends that's happening on Twitter and things like that. So you end up a bit like Microsoft bot, looking like a, like a teen with a lot of anger issues. I don't know why. <laughs> that seems to be... Uh, but I don't take input from, from the internet. So uh, there are different ways to, to do that, I guess. Like, yeah. But learning is the... Like, what Microsoft tried to do is probably uh, the apex of it where you learn but I guess it didn't uh, execute it properly because it just took input from anyone. I think there was even a 4chan thread that just attacked the bot with all kinds of strange things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So depends who you, what way you get your data from. So is your bot learning on the go? Um, currently, currently no, it's not learning on the go. Uh, I, I'm not letting it just take input from anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm collecting inputs and putting it in. Yeah. So where would that, on a spectrum of AI versus machine learning, fall? Like, is it because it's not learning? Does it imply that it's just like an artificial intelligence? And it, because it's not learning, so then is that machine learning or is being a bit separate? It's fuzzy, I guess. Is that fuzzy? Yeah, it's a bit between machine learning and I wouldn't call it machine learning yet. Maybe just uh, control, control learning or something. I don't know whether that. Because essentially you've set its parameters, right? You're That's saying right. that, I mean, it's very unlike a human, where a human is taking input from the outside world, processing it, and then trying to change. Whereas this one is very parameterized, where you're saying, okay, you only can do this and this, and there is no other way. It, it can't act on its... Well, it does like on trends, for example. So, uh, okay. trending terms, what other people are saying, and trying to throw that into... Uh, to a language processor. So that that is the part where it gets a bit of learning. A little bit. Does your language processor do anything with uh, uh, measuring emotions? Emotions, no. I do. I do have certain bad words. I try not to. I, I, I prevent the bots from tweeting bad <laughs> words because you'd be surprised how many um, <coughs> strange words there are that you don't want the bots to be saying. Yeah. Well, do you apply sentiment analysis before you post the uh, generated? Do I apply what? Uh, sentiment analysis or something? Oh yeah, I, I'm looking into trying to do that. Yeah, something to yeah, put sentiment or emotional, train some emotions. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, this is uh, James Pennybaker. Uh, he's done some research into pronouns and how how it um, reveals certain emotions. Ah, okay. Yeah. Who's that again? James. James Pennybaker. James Pennybaker. I have to look at the 
Does anyone watch this series called Person of Interest? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you know? Yeah. It's a uh, it's a very interesting series. Uh, it's written by Jonathan Nolan, uh, Christopher Nolan's brother, who writes most of the other movies as well. Uh, it's essentially an AI system uh, that well, I don't know where to classify right now. But it's it's an artificial intelligence that takes data from all government feeds uh, and then. Uh, Based on that, it can move its own location if it feels it's under the threat. Uh, by that, it means that it, it could issue commands to people uh, as if it was issued by a human to move its location. Uh, it, and it, to some extent, that's what you were saying. It, it's a large machine, so it essentially runs a lot of simulations. And then based on that, it could tell you what is a more probabilistic uh, positive outcome or negative outcome. Uh, yeah, I use big data. It collects all the inputs from all the um, security cameras. So, uh, and, and uh, so in that series, I mean, they don't explain any of the machines working. Uh, but in the initial stages of when they create the machine, uh, there is a part where the machine essentially learns emotions based on its administ uh, administrator's past events. Has anyone got any experience in how does kind of that kind of stuff work? Uh, where you kind of get a machine to understand emotion or like empathize, right? So that the machine essentially finds out that on this particular day, uh, this uh, the admin's father had died. So it kind of sympathizes with them and says, "Oh, I'm sorry for that," right? Uh, and it, that logic is kind of not written because. So I think humans are really complex creatures, so understanding emotions. <laughs> Our emotions change even hour to hour sometimes. Yeah, really hard. Hard. yeah it's, it's very based on the conditions of the events. I mean, today you can be suddenly sad and you hear some bad news. So. Or, or you might even be, be your bad news, your friends. Yeah, uh, on just while driving, suddenly there's accident with the next car and then you see very horrific stuff. Suddenly you Without any form of biofeedback from the human, it might be really difficult, I guess. From just maybe facial recognition would work, I guess. I've seen some science fiction movies where they look at a person's face and they try to uh, get the emotional, uh, emotional profile of the person. You could also analyze the text strings, for example, tweets. And you could, yeah, even from someone writing a, a tweet, um, they, they, you could measure some emotions and get some traits. Have you ever uh, going back to your um, uh, to your algorithm that you wrote? Have you ever taken into account the response of your tweets and try to not yet like, do, adjust just, your? Not much time I spent okay. on just the weekend. So yeah, I'm actually looking at uh, um, looking at the emotional aspect of the things. Okay. Right now, I'm just trying to get back to it. I have like two bots, uh, uh, about thousand to two thousand followers each. <laughs> are you sure all of them are not yeah. bots? <laughs> yeah. 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 like yeah. experimenting with bots. Sorry, right. they might be. So there might be. But they've been online for a few bots. years already. Yeah, so, so uh, bots following other other be. bots, and then yeah. you become just like uh, I mean, the bots are actually examining you, and then you are all experimenting right. so with bots. So that's not yeah, right. It's not that okay. okay. So like as, as you say, you know, how machine you are. Say you Take it, like a like. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to pick up on the point that you mentioned on, the, on looking at the words itself. I think one area is in AI, um, like uh, probably many machine learning will use a lot of supervised and supervised problems. Right? Uh, and uh, in the AI lingo, uh, that falls under things like uh, reasoning, uh, things like learning, and things like problem solving. These are the words that uh, the guys use in AI kind of equivalent the machine learning feeling. But uh, beyond that, there are all these other things which are a bit funny. Um, <clears throat> one is actually uh, knowledge representation. So uh, let me pick up on actually Marcus' example, which I like very much. Uh, I was quite interested in uh, you know, the way you represent um, uh, like a, a chessboard to a uh, program. You know, what is it? Is it like you know, uh, 64 columns with like a piece in each column, a category variable? Is it uh, something more? Is it an attachments to it and things like that? So knowledge representation is an uh, interesting one uh, that is kind of within ML, maybe not within ML. 
Another one that's within ML and maybe not within ML is um, uh, perception. And again, like, you know, when we talk about things like the imaging and all that, um, the, it's powered by machine learning. But for a program to, 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 to know that you know, it's hot, and the same program to also know that I'm near to a wall, and the same program to also know that you know, I'm going to do this thing because I'm near to a wall, and can do it. Uh, that perception thing is something that is piecemeal in the machine learning project, but uh, it's a bit more in, in AI. So, so I guess what I want to say, uh, based on you know, the, the word thing, is the knowledge representation of the word is very, very important. And, um, and now I'm going to uh, a space that I've kind of not done before, but one of my colleagues says, uh, you know, when you use uh, like natural language processing, and there are all these ways to represent words, um, you want to see whether is this a happy, is this to the guy happy? Uh, traditionally, what you do is you just throw in a whole bunch of dictionaries. These are the words. Ecstatic could be plus five. Um, mildly happy could be plus two. And okay, like terrible could be minus three. And kind of you bring all these things and like okay, this is a happy, happy tweet because it's more positive words. But another way to represent the same data is a uh, kind of like the word to back, sense to back, one to back kind of way. Where basically every word has is represented by um, a pretty like a black box of concepts. So if you look at you know what does the word man mean in 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 what to back representation, you you'll, you'll find a matrix of like I don't know like uh, hundreds of numbers which we don't know what it is. But so and, and the reason why this is the case is because a man is has a gender flavor to it. Man has a, a person flavor to it, has a living thing flavor to it, and somehow all these things are encapsulated in this uh, way of representing the word man. So um, my colleague that actually did a demo where you know use uh, uh, king minus man equals, and the computer came up with queen. Uh, king minus man plus woman equals queen. So I think representing data uh, is at the heart of um, of of, of uh, the, the computer being able to make intelligent things that approximate our, our reasoning. And, and so I think, you know, um, to make a point recognize emotion or to recognize um, meaning, the concept of meaning, will really be around the way we represent uh, the words that we use. Uh, I think the current record for the most complicated word is the word break. Uh, like, if I'm going to take a break, I broke this thing, you know, uh, break, break, it, give thanks, whatever. I think there's like 70 different meanings to 70 something meanings to the word break. And it's because of many uh, meanings and characters in one word that we need to represent uh, words in, in, in a way that's more complicated than the media. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, it's just a weird point because uh, the context of the words also important. Like man, uh, man was one of the words that I came across on Twitter. People use that every, very often. Like, man is hot. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it's like, difficult what? to find context of that. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's very interesting. So each word there's a whole matrix of data, and then uh, like king minus man. You know, so I think um, <laughs> like for those of you who are interested, there's a whole um, um, continuum of this. One is every word is represented. That's right. a word to back. And the other one is the, the more uh, difficult one where every sentence is represented. Where it's like, oh man, if it's, if man thinks the whole, it's probably not a real man, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's. Uh, <coughs> This bit I've not done before, but I don't play with it. But, uh, it's also the kind of like a menu. <laughs> menu. One the um, takeaways from it is English is probably not the best word to put in every person. Mm. Mm. So is there any, right? any kind of information on what kind of language is best mm. for machine learning? Going back to the chess example that you were discussing and, and, yeah. and the probabilistic values that it gives, uh, does the machine remember uh, all, or is it, but one, does it do it? Does it remember all its permutations and uh, the calculations that it does so that it can use that in a future scenario? Uh, that's one. Second, does it, is it efficient to do that? It definitely is. I mean, so I mean, one one obvious thing you can do is you know because you make moves in within one game, right? So this is what we're talking about. But when we're talking about playing games and you make moves, right? My move, your move, and that kind of thing. So uh, 
because gonna, after your move, it's going to be my move again, right? If I remembered what I, I looked for, I mean, or I, what I explored, you know, the, the possibility space that I explored in the previous, my previous move, I could build more on top of that, right? Rather than clean slate every time. So then there's the probabilistic number change. So the, the numbers that you were 0 0.6, 0 0.7, yeah, 0 0.9. It change. So it changes that, and it keeps a record of that over time. Too. Yeah. So that's how. So that's how a single kind of bot grows. Would that be right? In a sense, you could say it is. In a, in a sense, growing by exploring more possibilities as you play longer and longer. It's learning in some sense. It's, it's, it's learning because it's right. keeping. I mean, it's very akin to how humans would learn, right? I mean, I mean, although us as humans, well, again, but for the bot, it's easier to do. I guess for us as humans, if you make a move, you remember that move whether it worked or not. But you would not have a set somewhere written that you had thought about all these five other moves, which the next time you play a game and you fall in a similar scenario, you would simulate that one move. I mean, the machine says it's actually very simple statistics. It's just counting how many of the future games uh, I have I won. That's it. I mean, in a very simple way, just, if you just do that, it, it would work pretty well. You just count, remember that all of the futures I, I tried out, 5% uh, I have won. So it's actually probably not a good place to be, right? My 5% I lost. Things like that. So it's actually quite simple statistics. So it's using statistics to just map that. But in your case, like, there was like trillion, trillion, trillion possibilities. How do you kind of bring all of that? Yeah, so I think I talk about that. So the idea is, again, back to sampling. So we can't do all the trillions of possibilities, so we just do a random one, right? Then we, over time, we will sample the space. Okay. Okay. Remember how many times we made it. Wouldn't you limit, I don't know, just, just <coughs> actually really wrong, just have yeah. the wouldn't you limit, say, uh, say if there were 10 days to 46, I think, right? Chess, yeah. Chess. If you limit to a certain number and get different machines to run different numbers, of course. And then go, let them go against each other where all the possibilities are mapped, right? So if they all, say, if a certain state had four possible future scenarios, mm -hmm. you run against each of them. And since it's a machine, the other side could run the other possible scenarios. And then keep a record of all that. Which could then be collated into a single Sorry, machine. Is that how it? They do exactly that in AlphaGo, for example. That's why you have a cluster of machines. They can okay. look at because it's randomly random futures, right? Uh -huh. Each of the machines could look at a different random future. Then you aggregate the statistics out of your thousands of trains. Yeah, yeah they, they do exactly that. I didn't know that, so I learned something. That is what I wanted to learn. Okay, <laughs> so how machines work? Yeah. Okay. And what happens in scenarios where there are dependencies? How do they resolve those? What do you mean by that? So, like say for example, uh, uh, there's a scenario where, uh, so the, the, the variables are not independent, right? The variables are dependent where if one variable did something, it would affect the other variable. Okay. The, or the output of the other variable with something else would change. How do, 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 do scientists or do researchers try to solve these problems or they are like, okay, it's too hard of a mathematical problem or computational problem that it's worth making just guesses of certain things and running with them? I have many ways to parallelize or distribute the computation so that you can utilize many machines. So I think one of the ways you can do it is just do it at the very top, where the very first move you're going to make. And that's clearly going to be independent because after that, this is all. If you try to do it nested inside, it's, it's, I guess it's more complicated. Because you say, if I make another move with my... Yeah, so for example, like I was reading about this, I, uh, a certain example where, say, so a, there's a grand, the, the idea of independent variables and variables, and there's some theorem around it, I can't remember most of it. Yeah. Like, uh, the idea was that uh, a grandmother give, has five, grand, uh, a lady has five grandchildren, okay. and she gives them uh, every year a chocolate on their birthday, or on, a, on, on New Year's, right? Now, uh, she needs to decide out of 10 chocolates, which uh, she, she knows from some from past data that uh, out of these 10 chocolates, uh, every person, in, uh, every child likes a certain chocolate. But then, there is a dependency. So if the first child takes a red chocolate, the second child, because his tendency is to take whatever the first child takes, he takes a red chocolate. So, trying to guess what is the best allocation of chocolates that needs to be there. 
there are too many possibilities. Uh, uh, so what happens in those scenarios? Like chess is still a confined problem, right? right? In this case, because the dependent variables keep changing, uh, uh, since the variables are dependent, how do people look at such problems? I think that the, the traditional technique there is always just look at the parts that are independent and try to just break it along those lines. I mean, even look at you know, in probability, I mean, you have a, you have a distribution over multiple variables, right? It's actually a very complex uh, form because it's going to be really, you need a lot of numbers actually, right? You represent the distribution over 10 variables, for example, right? Because for each of the combination of 10 variables, you have one probability, right? So actually, you need a very large, uh, even to represent this, this distribution, it's very complicated. So what people do is, normally you just say, but probably these three are related, independent and so on, and these other three, then they are sort of, these two groups are not dependent. So you can sort of factor into two separate distributions, which are like half the size in some sense, right? And then you can, you can get the joint distribution, you just multiply, you know, it's, because independent you just do multiplication, right? Yeah. So the problem becomes simpler, right? So you just break it into smaller subgroups that are, so you try and make Literally it as independent as possible. Right. You figure out where are the, the groups that are independent. Then leave the dependent ones alone I mean, because they are dependent, but you can't break it further. Yeah. I want to have a go at answer my question as well. So uh, I think uh, I think this this question is really a bit of a rabbit hole. You can go like quite long into it. Uh, but uh, I think I see like two approaches to approach the problem and it depends on who you ask. So within, uh, I guess, like some of the data science uh, people, there's like almost like two religions. One are people who are kind of grown up through the mathematical modeling and statistical modeling. And when they see dependent variables, they will use their intuition, they'll do interviews, and they'll try to explicitly account for all these things. So you have like 10 variables, plus a whole bunch of log variables, interaction variables, and they will hand code these things, like I will account for all these things that I expect. Uh, the other school of thought are the people I grew up by, the <coughs> Uh, the comp science and now kind of just like you know, give me the blackest of black box. I don't know, I don't care how it works, but it works better than you, so ha ha kind of thing. And, and, and so they were just like, okay, uh, stuff that uh, I won't use anything linear, I'll use uh, extremely non linear thing like one of those learning neural network algorithms that would code up its own features. And I don't even know what features they're coding up, but it can account for uh, dependencies, multiple inheritances, all these things. I don't know which ones they're counting for and or how, but they by choosing the right <coughs> algorithm and putting in our computing power behind it. Like, your mind. So, it depends on who you ask. Uh, I've seen both of these things go uh, in parallel. And the stats points uh, are actually pretty good, but they are understandable. So, you talk to a person, like, you know, uh, yeah, you got 81%, I got 78%, but you know what? I tell you what's going on. That guy's like, can I you, but I don't care. <laughs> and, yeah. Every day you get these two guys like uh, da, da, da. <laughs> yeah. But it's a very classic example from statistics, right? I mean, it shows the well, not statistics, many from classification, a little like spam filtering, right? You know, like there is an email uh, spam or not, right? and then uh, in all the early days was something called naive base uh, classification, yeah. right? You may have read about it. So that the example that I was trying to give the grandmother and the children that is where I was trying to understand naive base. But what they do there actually is they just make a simplified assumption. Yeah, they they pretend that everything is independent, right. even though they are dependent in, in reality. But they just pretend that they are independent, and it works really well actually, even though it's not the assumption is wrong, but somehow. Well, I think we still don't fully understand why that's the case, but yeah. sometimes you just ignore the problem. Right? If there's a big problem, you just pretend it doesn't exist and move along and see if it still works out. It may. We have to close this session. Ah, okay. Thanks a lot, guys.